Discord. There's a lady. Um, so yeah, so welcome again. Thanks so much. Um, I'll be talking tonight about the Point Pinos Sea Watch project. Let's see if this gets going. So what is it exactly? Um, do -do -do. Sorry, changing this around so it's that speaker view, maybe. Hmm, but it's showing your Sorry, I gotta move everybody's faces out of here. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so um, so what is it exactly? What what's a sea watch? Um, well, sea watching is looking out to sea, but um what we're doing with this project is we actually hire a professional seabird counter. So um, there's maybe only a dozen or so people who um, A, have the skill set to do this and B, uh, would want to do this or, you know, are willing to do this long period of just standing in the elements and staring out at, at the sky and the sea and counting these birds. So it's it's a pretty, um, you know, unique, unique project. There's not a lot of people who can can do that that professionally. Um, but they're out there, you know, dawn to dusk, this, these counters. So it's about 11 hours a day. November 1st to December 15th, so a long stretch of time um, that they're out there and they're counting pretty much every bird that goes by, a couple target species, um, you know, but yeah, to the average person, this might seem like um, a pretty wacky idea. Why Why would you do this? <laughs> but, you know, you guys are all already on board because you like birds, but there's a lot of other cool reasons why uh, monitoring seabirds is a good, a good idea. Uh, seabirds are really strong indicators of marine ecosystem health, um, which you know humans depend on. The oceans like uh, controls the weather of the planet, so it's really good to have an idea of what's going on out there. Um, seabirds are the top consumers in the marine food web, so monitoring them allows us to kind of look at different biological effects that might be impacting their populations, or they're showing us you know parameters that might be changing, like sea surface temperature. Um, like this graph shows, seabirds are a really imperiled group of birds. Um, populations worldwide have declined nearly 70% since, since the 1950s. So yeah, pretty, pretty dramatic um, decline there. So nearly half of the remaining species are um, threatened or near threatened from all sorts of, you know, human caused um, issues, uh, you know, climate change related um, changes to their prey resources, changes to extreme weather events. Fisheries bycatch is a problem for a lot of these um, really open ocean birds. Um, loss of breeding habitat or uh, non-native or invasive species on their nesting islands, all sorts of things kind of uh, challenging them. So um, conducting this monitoring helps collect data, which can determine migratory pathways or just basic population information, which can be really hard to assess with these species that are not in our backyards. They're they're way out there. Um, and there's, you know, quite a few offshore wind energy projects kind of in the, in the works here in California. So having this baseline data... Um, is going to be really important, I think. And um, it's also fun and educational. So it's fun for us bird watchers. It's fun for the public walking by. Um, you know, obviously, obviously, we're really into it, but a lot of people like it too. A lot of birders like to come out because you don't get seasick. You're seeing seabirds, yeah. but you're not having to pay money or, um, you know, take Dramamine. Um, and go out on one of these boats because a lot of these species, at least certainly on really windy days, um, you know, are open ocean species, proper pelagic species like albatrosses. Um, I've still never seen a lay sand albatross in the wild, but they have seen them at the Point Pinos Sea Watch. So that's pretty amazing. Um, again, got to have some of those winds pushing them closer, but um, the 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 promise is there. And that's what drives us outside every day looking. Um, and there are some famous Sea Watch locations over on the East Coast, apparently. I've never been to these spots, but um, in Cape May, New Jersey, their bird observatory is called the Avalon Sea Watch. Um, it's probably like the most famous Sea Watch on the East Coast, and it's managed by New, New Jersey Audubon. They run it late December into, or late September into late December. Um, there's also some apparently in Newfoundland and Long Island. Um, and in the Midwest as well, you wouldn't think of it as, you know, seabirds proper, but um, a lot of the same species we're going to be seeing coming down also fly through um, over the Great Lakes and then disperse to the East and West Coasts. And so this is actually where our uh, 2022 and 2023 Sea Watch counter, our paid staff person, Allison, she came from, well, she's from Michigan. So she spends a lot of time up on the Great Lakes. 
and she's worked at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory um, for many years, probably like at least over 10, I think, um, way up on the Upper Peninsula. So that's um, that's kind of her her stomping grounds and so foreign to me. I've never been there, but um, very beautiful, obviously, from the picture. So we've been surveying out here since about 2015. So some days it's just the lone counter. This was Carl. He um, was probably like the third or fourth counter we had um, paid out there, paid to be out there. Um, a lot of times though, there's a horde of birders, you know, um, if it's good weather, if it's really birdy, um, just a nice sunny day, a lot of people like to come out. So it's just a really fun place to be. And a lot of like pro knowledge to be learning from. Um, to just kind of up your game with seabirding because it's it's challenging to to spot some of these things that are far away hard to ID them and again they're not birds we're familiar with because I don't know about you guys but I don't live out in the uh in the open ocean kind of a landlubber and um so yeah it's just we're unfamiliar with them so there's lots to learn still the cool thing about um Point Pinos the way the reason we can do this even is because of the the geography of the bay um, the geography matters. And so there's all these birds migrating south from having nested up in the Arctic and um, they're following the coastline. And, you know, maybe especially the first year birds, they maybe have this like genetic memory, genetic blueprint or map that's saying, you know, fly south, keep the land on your left and you'll be set. Eventually you'll get to warmer <laughs> water and there'll be a bunch of other loons and that's where you stop. So they're flying, you know, south down the coast here and then they kind of fetch up here in, in the crook of Monterey Bay here. And they're like, oh, no, I can't go south anymore. Uh, there's land in the way. And a lot of these seabirds, they don't they don't like flying over land. Uh, opposite of the raptors. I know Mary's on the video tonight. Raptors don't like flying over water. So it's like reverse of the, the raptor situation. So they get down into Monterey, uh, that, cro that crook kind of in Monterey Bay, South Monterey Bay. And they're all like, oh, no, quick. And they have to hug the coastline really tight to get around the peninsula and then keep going south you know they're just they've got that southward movement they're trying to aim for flying back you know northwest is doesn't doesn't you know they don't that doesn't feel right so they're hugging that coast pretty close and that's where we can see them and so this is maybe uh this is an airplane view but maybe a very high up bird's eye view of flying south along the peninsula or i'm sorry along the bay and and yeah you can look across and see the peninsula sticking out and some birds, uh, just the other night, we were seeing quite a few loons when we were at the farmer's market in Pacific Grove, common loons flying over top. And we're like, oh, they must have been high enough up. They could maybe see the water. And they were like, oh, I can make that, you know, cross, cut a, cut the corner a little bit. Um, but mostly birds are, are hugging this corner really tight, right at Point Pinos. And so that's, um, that's why it's a good place to stand and look for seabirds. Generally, there's these things called flight lines that are the like prevailing tracks these birds are flying um, as they're migrating past. And apparently, you know, there's like known um, flight lines for like the, the East Coast observatories and stuff. They're like, oh, yeah, it's coming down that one that one line that all the loons fly. Um, but this was kind of just a mock up that um, Blake made for Allison last year. And I got a little screen grab of it. And it's just showing these these uh, loops around the bay. So it says the prevailing flight line is this one that cuts across here. Um, it's the most useful flight line for surf scoters. SUSC is the alpha code, the abbreviation for surf scoter. Scoter is a type of duck, a sea duck. You'll become very familiar with them uh, hanging out at Point Pinos this fall. Um, and then PALO is Pacific Loon. Those are kind of our two main target species. The majority of the, the big flocks we see go by will be those birds. Um, so it says it's most useful for the scoters and the loons coming from southeast to northwest as birds trace the bay line slash the peninsula lines, the curve of the bay. But the wind is very dynamic. It can change the orientation. Not uncommon to miss flocks flying overhead, especially the common loon, C-O-L-O, -O, um, shortcutting over the peninsula. Um, some flocks, especially loons, can bypass the bay line uh, and go for a straight north-south or northeast-southwest flight offshore, sometimes too distant to accurately capture. Passing on the outside is what they're calling that. And that's this, um, uh, that leftmost, you know, almost vertical, well, 45 degree angle going up to the top right. That's the like passing on the outside line where things are, um, didn't fly around the curve of the bay. They're just going due south. 
and yeah, that's where we've had, when we've had the really big um, Pacific Loon flights in the past, um, at least the really crazy one we saw with um, Liam, who was our counter two years ago, that was that line out there they were flying. So you're kind of looking really far out, you're looking close up. Sometimes the, the birds will be flying right overhead. And then sometimes someone says, wait, look behind you. And they'll be flying over the golf course. So it's really kind of head on a swivel, just looking around. Um, everybody's trying to see, see these birds. So what are they seeing? This is, um, yeah, a classic dreary day out on the coast. But um, even if the weather's bad, we're going to be out there. Um, so here's a view through... Um, a spotting my spotting scope this is my phone camera through a spotting scope looking out at that red buoy and if you watch for a little bit you'll see there's this bird that goes up and over there he goes Wee! and that's a black-footed albatross so that was i can't believe i got it uh through my phone um this is like a slow down view but that red buoy offshore the point pinos buoy is a really good marker like um when you're on land you're talking about like trees or it's behind that building out on the ocean it's often you know, a rock, the buoy, the moss landing smokestacks, different things like that, that you're trying to um, orient around. Here comes the albatross, whee, up and over. That was really special. So black-footed albatross, not laysan, but um, uh, and you can see how much the waves are dipping. So that's a real struggle is, um, uh, you know, seeing these birds on a windy day, the cool birds are out, but it's hard to get your eyes on them. Uh, here's another cool shot. This is from, um, Brian Sullivan, he's out there most days. He's got this massive camera. And this was a wild, crazy day. Um, this is from on land. It looks like we're on a boat, but we're looking out and there's city sheer waters. Those are the all black birds. Um, they kind of do the big arcs. Woo! Over the seeds. Same like the albatrosses. Um, there's definitely a lot of gulls, common murs down low. There were phalaropes. Um, that was a whole crazy stormy day with lots of different species moving around. So here's a nice view, again, Brian Sullivan uh, shot of surf scoters flying past. So these are that these are that sea duck species that um, you may, may or may not be familiar with. Scoter, kind of a weird name, um, but surf scoters are um, one of the main birds we're looking at. All black, white stripe up the back of their neck, at least for the drakes, the males, um, and a big colorful beak. They're, they can be misidentified as puffins sometimes because of that really big colorful bill. And the females, of course, like with most of the ducks, um, they're all kind of brown. Uh, here's some other cool birds you'll see though, that, you know, again, the little perk, you know, that that brings us out to the to the coast every time is the the promise of seeing something super, super rare, super exciting. Whether or not we get these kind of pictures, or that's a whole nother thing, right? So these were all the pictures from this slideshow are, are from Blake Matheson, uh, our Audubon president. He's got a big, big camera. And this was probably out on a pelagic birding trip, but um, still a bird we could spy from shore. So black-footed albatross, absolutely enormous, long, skinny wingspan, um, beautiful bird. Storm petrels are pretty special. Fork-tailed storm petrel, that's what this bird is called. They're like a little miniature albatross, same family, but instead of massive and huge, they're like the size of like a robin. So um, really hard to spot on those days when the waves are going up really high, 10 foot, 14 foot waves, um, but they like the windy days. So that's when you're most likely to have them around. Harder to spot them though. Parasitic Jaeger, really, oh, that's right. I misspelled this. I need to go back and change it. Um, I noticed that's the one I noted on Sunday and then forgot to change. Uh, Jaegers are pretty, um, uh, uh, what's the word? They're like kleptoparasites. So they really specialize in chasing other birds and stealing their food. So sometimes you'll see just like this kind of wild um, chase on the horizon and you'll look up and it might be a Jaeger chasing some terns or a Sabin's gull or, um, or another gull species, you know, but they're usually doing some crazy loop-de-loops and chases out there, high up off the water. That's another thing we'll talk about, but just the where stuff is, um, you know, the stratification on the skyline, whether it's on the water, flying above the water, you know, all the way up, it's above the mountain line, you know, you'll see the, the ridge line of the Santa Cruz mountains across the bay, it could be above that or flying at the ridge line. Again, other ways to try to describe where is a bird when you just have the ocean uh, as your template you're working with. Here's more surf scoters going past. These guys are great. Uh, another group, and you can see again, the males and females mixed in. 
Um, like with a lot of the kind of, you know, freshwater duck species, unfortunately with the females, I'm often just like, where's the, where's the male? <laughs> like, I'm going to identify this bird based on where the male is and what he looks like. So the females are all quite cryptic, uh, harder to tell apart. Although quite a few of the birders there will be able to tell you uh, a black scoter female duck from a surf scoter female duck. So we'll pick up those this winter again. So here we go. Here's an example of that. So looking down this line of birds, there's at least on the far left, there's two male surf scoters. You got that white patch on the back of their neck. Then this goofy guy here, third from the left, all black, but with that kind of yellow. Um, it looks like the beak is yellow, but it's actually this really thick, um, like a patch, like a band-aid or something almost you'd, he has around his beak. I don't know what that's called. It's kind of fleshy, not like the beak uh, tissue. But anyways, that's a black scoter. So that's a whole different species of of scoter that's out there. And of course, kind of like the cormorants, there's three different scoter species. Surf scoters, most common. White winged is maybe the second most common. Uh, they luckily do have quite a big white patch on their wings. So that's helpful to see. And then this is the black scoter. Probably the, I feel like it's probably the most rare one of the three. Um, there's also three loon species um, that are going by. So we have these nice like groups of three, uh, three different species that are sneaking by. Here's another view of a surf scoter flock with a black scoter mixed in. So he's the guy right here in the middle, all black with that kind of yellow saddle. Maybe that's the word. I don't think it's a seer. So C-E-R-E -E is the word for that kind of bit of fleshy skin on raptor beaks. That's usually right here, like the red-shouldered hawks. They have a black beak, but then that yellow seer. I'm not sure if it's the same thing on ducks, but um, I need to look into that. But yeah, you can see he looks different. And again, I'm kind of <laughs> waving my hands at the females, just like, oh, and then they're mostly probably females, but um, that's okay. Most of the time, uh, we don't have to get down to the species level. That's what the, that's what Allison's going to be doing. That's what our, our counters will be doing if she has any helpers that day. Um, a lot of us can just be there to provide uh, outreach and education to the public. So we don't have to be IDing uh, each of these female ducks as they fly by. Lucky us. Here's another one of our common birds that are zooming by. This is a flock of common murs. And um, murs are kind of like, they're one of my favorite birds. They look like a penguin, but they can fly. So they got one up on the penguin for sure. But yeah, white butt, white belly. Um, in the winter, they should have a white face as well. In the breeding season, they have all black on their face. And then the black back, uh, they're about the size of like a football and they flap really rapidly. And this is pretty uh, appropriate. You know, they're down uh, against the water. So all those scoter pictures, it was them up against a blue sky. These guys are down on the water. So some bird species, you're identifying them by where they fly. <laughs> what layer are they at in the sky? Right above the water, high up off the water, big loose flock, like way up high and way out. That's often like the loons. Um, so a lot of tricky things that, um, you know, with, with backyard birding, you can just look at your field guide and look at the plumage and match these things up. Uh, a lot of the like behavior and flight patterns and how rapidly they're flapping, those are going to be your key features for um, for seabirding. Here's a nice up close view of a common mer in their non-breeding or basic plumage. Tufted puffin, that actually could go by. Um, we won't have this good of a view most likely, but both horned and tufted puffins have been counted at the sea watch. And loons, here we go. Here's our common loon. Um, it's the biggest of the three loon species that go by. Huge feet sticking out the back and a big, big chunky beak and head. Um, they often fly, are the ones flying over the land and cutting across the peninsula because they're one of those species that spends a lot of time inland, you know, like up in the Great Lakes. Um, and some of them do winter kind of in the southeast as well. So a little bit more like okay with flying over land than the other two, which are a lot more marine. The Pacific loon is one of the other ones. This is our most common loon species of the three. And then the red-threaded loon is the smallest and slimmest of the three. They often fly with their head kind of held lower down. Um, the loons, I have to admit, I'm always just like, it's a loon. And then Allison will say, that's a red-threaded loon, man. And I'm like, yeah, love it. You know, that's so good. Um, one of these years, I'll get it really dialed in, but um, it takes practice. So we always get some fun rarities like a booby, guaranteed, you know, brown booby or masked booby should show up this fall again. Heck, maybe the red-footed booby, booby will swing back by. Ah, there you go, brown booby, that was seen one year. 
And then, of course, there's more of our coastal birds, uh, shorebirds that are kicking around on the on the rocky intertidal kind of area. They'll be passing by regularly. Wimbrels, of course, are one of our standards out there, all brown with that down curved beak. Oyster catchers, you guys all know them. Uh, loud, shrill chorus as they go by yelling about something that they're upset about. Hopefully not drones, just each other. They can be just just territorial. Uh, we also get some larger waterfowl, big old flocks of geese going by. Um, this is a mixed uh, cackling goose and greater white fronted goose flock. So those can go by sometimes. Um, I don't remember if it was last year or the year prior, but there was a little group that hung out on the golf course almost the whole count season. So there's like greater white fronted goose, cackling goose, like a single snow goose maybe was in the mix and then some Canada geese. And it's just kind of a nice comparison. Um, we don't often have much diversity with the big geese, except, you know, it's just Canada geese all summer long. But in the winter, we get some fun, fun birds showing up. And then your general, you know, scrum of Hearman's gulls and Western gulls, they'll be out there sneaking around or flying loudly around. So how are these guys collecting data? The people who are actually doing the counting and estimating these numbers, sometimes there's really crazy big flocks of birds zooming by. Um, I can't speak to every, you know, uh, technique they use for estimating some of these numbers. There's lots of different ways that they might um, try to assess, you know, what is the number of that huge flock that's now going by. I have 10 seconds to figure that out. Um, but the data is being recorded using eBird, uh, like most of us are, are familiar with, using the mobile app um, on, on their phones out there. And uh, they do a count every hour. So it's kind of like the pelagic um, birding protocols. If you're out on a boat, you do a count every hour. And they're out there um, pretty much dawn to dusk every day. And they're counting everything going by, kind of regardless of the direction of movement and everything like that. Um, but, uh, but then people are always like, well, how do you know you're not counting the same bird? I mean, we kind of don't, but you do it long enough for a big enough chunk of time over a long period of time, many years trends will emerge is the goal. Um, and if it comes down to like, you know, there's a massive Pacific loon flock going overhead and yet you can hear some oyster catchers, you know, squawking around. Allison will be focusing on those loons. Those are kind of our, our main target species that we're, we're trying, to, um, trying to count. So how do we help? So for most of us, and certainly if you're one of the pro birders, feel free to offer your assistance. Or if you can just say, I will count pelicans for you, Allison, you know, you can join in with that. But what's really helpful is actually engaging with the public. Um, if, if someone's trying to count that huge flock of birds going overhead, you know, you don't need someone tapping on their shoulder and saying, excuse me, are you looking at whales? Classic, classic question, that or sea otters, of course. Um, so um, that's a really good place for us to step in and um, say, oh, hi there. Like, you might be interested in what we're doing. You know, all these people here are looking at seabirds. There's loads of birds just offshore, you know, and you might not be able to see them right now with your bare eyes, but like, let's, st let's stare out there for a minute. See those black specks? So, um, you know, as you guys, you guys know the, know the drill. Uh, a lot of you are docents for other uh, local, you know, uh, engagement, public engagement kind of programs. So you can talk about marine protected areas. You can talk about your favorite sea life, um, birds, of course. Uh, we'll have a bin out there. I'll talk more about the resources that are in our little outreach bin that should be there every day. Because um, you can always just pedal, pedal the brochures, hand them out and share with people and um, relay what you've learned here tonight. What you've learned here tonight. Whoop, just sec, someone's. Here's some voices, let me. Make sure everyone's muted here. So the um in the outreach bin, these are two of my favorite books. I'll just put that up front if you want to purchase one um, or both. Uh, but that offshore sea life ID guide is really great. It's a really thin book, and it's you know it's got the same content content as the Sidley Birds of the West guide, but it's curated to what you would see like in the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it's really great. It was written by Brian Sullivan. It has super great pictures. There's copies of both of these books in the outreach bin. So you'll have access to them when you're there um, doing outreach at the uh, at the Sea Watch location. So um, that's in the bin, as well as some big laminated um, pictures of kind of our target species, a big map of Monterey Bay. That's really helpful when you're describing, you talk about the submarine canyon, you know, why is this such an amazing place for marine life? Um, 
but the the satellite imagery of the bay is super great. I reference that all the time. Um, there's a whiteboard. We'll be keeping track of like our 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 updates of the birds we were seeing, which you can access on eBird, of course. That um, the eBird, I think we compile it as like a field trip report, maybe. I have to remember how I did that last year, but the link will be on our Sea Watch page. So you can always, even if you're not going out there, but you want to know what Allison's been seeing, you can go on eBird um, or on that link on our Sea Watch page to go to eBird to see what's getting counted out there. So um, that's a fun way to follow along, kind of. And when you're out there, it can get super duper cold. Um, make sure you dress really warm. Um, oh, here's the e the eBird page. Um, so yes, eBird is where all the data is going into, of course. Uh, Point Pino Sea Watch only is what that hot spot is called. Um, it's different than if you were birding, you know, on the golf course or the cemetery or something like that. Like, I'll say on this page real quick, um, but just wanting to be really clear about dressing warm because sometimes it's like really sunny and you feel like you're getting sunburned and um, it's like being out on the ocean almost like really reflective ocean you can get really red and chapped. So sunscreen's good, but then some days it's really, really cold and you'll want to have like a puffy jacket or hats and gloves. If your hands are out, it'll be really cold. Um, you know, bring binoculars if you have them, bring your spotting scope if you want to join in with uh, spotting birds offshore. If you have one that you're, you know, um, happy to share with people or you're okay sharing with people, that's really great to, you know, just stick it on a, a stationary bird, an oyster catcher or a, a sea otter and just invite people to look through and just kind of realize how much activity is happening just offshore, even though um, maybe sometimes people don't notice it. They just see, oh, the ocean, beautiful view. It's it's our job to point out all the cool stuff that's living out there. Um, and what else is there? Ah, uh, yeah, so here's scheduling. So there's not any like really um, specific scheduling. It's quite open. But this year, we're really trying to make sure that we have a buddy system in place, especially in the morning and evening um, for our for our counters out there, because they're out there. I got sunrise and then staying until the sun's going down. Um, so I've set up this um, volunteer sign up page and you can get to it on the Sea Watch web page on our Audubon website, which you use to get to the Zoom meeting. So hopefully you're familiar with it. You just scroll a little further down from the Zoom meeting to um sign up for a volunteer shift. It's a big black button and you push that and you'll get to this page. And um, all you have to do is, is say sign up and then type in your name. And I'm asking that you maybe put in the, the time frame you want to be there. Um, so we're, we're aiming for morning and evening support. I made a slot for our weekends because that's, if, especially if it's a nice weekend, there'll be a lot of, um, a lot of people out there walking the coast trail. It's just a good opportunity to be out there talking to folks, kind of running interference between the curious public and the bird counters. Um, but there, you know, everyone's going to be there dawn to dusk. So, or Allison will be the counter. So you can come anytime basically during the day. Um, if you just finished, you know, a class and you want to come out there, just swing by. If you just have an hour to swing by, that's good. If it's just 30 minutes and checking in. Um, but if you can sign up for one of these shifts, that would be really helpful just because a lot of us um, board members and stuff are going to, you know, we got to fill in the gaps to make sure that um, there's someone out there in the morning and the evening. So um, it's really nice when it's nice and sunny. When it's really cold, it might be a little tough, but um, you can always hang out in your car and um, if it's like raining and stuff. But um, there's always something to see out there. You know, we all experience this just in our general nature watching and bird watching. There's always something and you won't see it unless you go outside. So um, might as well go swing by and see how things are going. And um, you might be there when something really rare blows by, like a, a short-eared owl or the snow bunting last year. Like, that was crazy. Um, so yeah, I know there's a lot of bayonet folks, oyster catcher monitors, Point Lobos docents. Um, you know, thank you all so much for agreeing to come and help out with our Sea Watch program. I hope you learn a lot this fall and have a lot of fun. And um, it's really uh, uh, fulfilling and lots of, uh, you know, lots of opportunities to talk to the public about all the cool marine life and the sanctuary and everything that we love about this area. Um, so with that, I'll certainly take any uh, any questions that people have, because this is kind of, I might have gone too fast. But if you want to go back and review a slide or a picture, um, just let me know. Feel free to come off mute and um, and we can answer questions. 
Hey, Amanda, yeah. I have a quick, I have a quick comment. Oh, yes. Comments are good too. Thank you for that awesome, um, uh, overview. Um, I just want to mention, and there's absolutely no obligation whatsoever, but Allison loves treats. She has no, <laughs> yes. um, she has no food preferences, but, um, she often isn't able to really spend a lot of time eating. Um, so, um, I try to bring her burritos periodically from the Pinos grill. Um, and, uh, she's just so grateful and is just so, um, um, just, just a really cool, easygoing person. If it's not super busy, um, you'll really enjoy, um, meeting her. Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, if it's quiet out there, you can, you can ask questions. Like I said, I'm still, I'm always trying to get these loons sorted out. I feel like every year I just, did I forget everything? What happened? Because I know I talked with her last year about this too, but how did you identify that red throated loon? You know, and she'll tell you she's super friendly. So if it's not like a really busy day and there's not a bunch of people already asking her questions. Yeah. Feel free to just hang out and learn. It's like, yeah, it's a great resource. Kind of just like, um, like a class, almost like an informal class to learn about seabirds. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Um, when you say it, she's out there at sunrise and sunset uh, until sunset. So, so how do we sign up to be there at sunrise if we don't know a time? Well, that's what's tricky. I can't write a time in because mm -hmm. we're at that time of year where the sunrise is changing. It's it's getting yes. you know er earlier, and then we're gonna have a time change soon. Anyways, so it's kind of, it's hard to write that into the schedule. So I just wrote it as morning support. So the okay. idea is, and in fine print, it says meet at sunrise, stay for an hour or so. So, um, you know, you can look up maybe when, when's the sunrise. I do that on our, um, just the homepage of my like weather, Monterey weather website, and it'll usually say sunrise and sunset times. So yeah, you can try to show up around then, um, either end sunrise or sunset. Oh, I should mention sunrises might be early, you know, um, so it's tough getting going, but that's often when they have the best bird flights. The crazy Pacific Loon Day we had two years ago with Liam, that was like 7 a.m. And I come rolling up at like eight and everyone's like, that was crazy. Wow. And I was like, no, what did I, you know, I cut the tail end of it. It was kind of trickling off. Um, but I often do the evening support because that's when you get the best sunsets. Um, so some of the most amazing pictures and crazy, you know, cotton candy, ice cream colored swirly skies I've ever seen are in the evenings at Point Pinos. Um, oh yeah, Jacqueline just put in the, um, the chat that, yeah, the time change is coming up Sunday, November 5th. So yes, Ooh. that's going to be tricky. That weekend always, I always get so stressed out. I'm missing something by an hour, always a little confusing for us, but, um, but yeah, evenings are fun for sunsets. And maybe, you know, I think that's when that owl showed up that one time, short-eared owl. Um, mornings are good for like the big bird numbers. Oh, and Mary just posted in timeanddate.com for sunrise and sunset times. Thank you, Mary. Okay, oh, cat woke up. super. Thank I you. I have a question, Amanda. What, so I was just looking at the sign up thing, which is on a sign up genius. Do we have to have a special like sign up genius sign in code or anything? Or can we just go to this and sign up? Yeah, you just um you just click sign up. Yeah, I definitely didn't want to make everybody do a, another login and password or something. So you just have to sign up and you type in your name, first and last name and an email. And then there's a comment section and that's where you can type in the time you want to be there. Um, okay. And um, yeah, but you don't have to sign up any other. Um, you don't have we to create don't have any to sort have of profile. sign up genius login or anything. Okay. Nope. Yep. Don't need that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. That's a good question. Anybody else have any questions or anything? I'm going to see if I can scroll back through. Um, Yeah, for eBird, like I said, I'll try to have the link. I think I'm pretty sure last year we were assembling, um, you know, because there's hmm, like an 11 eBird checklists a day if it's every hour for 11 hours. And then you can assemble those all into what are called um, field trip reports. So if any of you guys have gone on a pelagic birding trip or maybe, um, you know, participated in just like a marathon day of birding or Christmas bird count, we do it for Christmas bird count too, where we assemble like all the individual checklists into a big 
field trip report, it's called. So it'll have all the checklists listed and kind of aggregate all of the species. Um, so that link will be on our Sea Watch page once we start birding November 1st. So I'll get that added there. But you can always go on ebird.org and look up Point Pino Sea Watch. And um, uh, Point Pino Sea Watch is going to be one of the, is going to be the observer. That's what Allison's login name is or the counter their login name is. So you'll see that as the submitter, the observer of the birds. And yeah, yeah, this is funny. So this number two is common myrrh with an X. That's when it's like too many to count. And the birder was like, I can't do it. <laughs> X. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that can happen. Don't feel pressured to, if you're, if you're out birding and it's like too many, or you don't know what it is, you can always say it's, you know, uh, um, you know, a sparrow species You've done that. You can always do X if it's just too many to count. No shame in that. So um, eBird's a great resource there. These two books are super great. Oh, also in the bin, I forgot to mention, um, there's going to be some vests. So some of you might have, um, you know, your cool bayonet jacket or your oyster catcher vest, or if you just have a favorite, like, you know, classic khaki birding vest with all your pockets and stuff, you can wear that, but there's going to be a nice, like high vis vest and a fleecy, uh, Monterey Audubon. It'll have the little crest on the chest. And then also a cool khaki one that says wildlife monitor on the back. So there's three vests. If you want to really be a, a point person for guests or the public walking by, people walking by, if you want to be, you know, if you want them to be drawn to you, to talk to you, you can put that vest on. To, or if you need to be a little more authoritative, if someone's like flying a drone and you want to get into that, you know, educating people, you can always put one of those vests on when you show up. Uh, make sure you put it in the bin before you leave. But those are cool resources I got in there for this year. So besides the specific times and dates to sign up on with the for the morning and evening, mm -hmm. it's a matter of just saying, oh, I've got a couple hours, so I'll go out and hang out at Point Pinos today, and I don't, we don't need to like tell you we're doing it or sign up or any of that stuff. Oh, yeah, you can just show up for that bit. Um, trying to go back to my sign up page. It was pretty much like, yeah, that morning and evening support. And then we did have a slot I added here for weekends. This is Weekend Warrior. Um, mm. just to try to make sure there's someone out there on the weekends doing outreach. Um, but it's not, yeah, Jacqueline just put in November 12th is a half marathon. Oh yeah. I have a friend who's running in that, uh, along the coastline. Yeah. That's always hard for parking. <laughs> so, um, you know, the look, Allison's basically out where there's, where Ocean View Boulevard stops going West and starts going South, right? Right where the point is. And so that's usually where she's standing. So there is some parallel parking right there in that gravel parking along Point Pinos and, um, Usually you can just kind of pull in there and have, stop out, step out of your car, put your little vest on, set up a scope and boom, you're started. Um, but yeah, marathon days, a busy weekend with lots of tourists, you might have to park kind of further away and walk over or something. Um, again, that's a benefit of the early shift. Allison always gets a good parking spot because she's the first one out there most mornings. So if you want to do the early shift, you won't have to come trekking in from way over by a Silomar Avenue or something. Um, but yeah, so yeah, holiday weekends, Thanksgiving will be around in there. November 12th is the half marathon. Um, just be aware that it will be crowded on the coast. It's a beautiful place. Everyone wants to be there. Yeah. Any other questions or do we want to review? I'm just, I was going to look at some cool pictures. Oyster oh. catcher. While oh. you're looking at pictures, I do have a question. Yeah. You let's brought hear up it. drones. And I wanted to know what the policy is about people with drones. Yeah, so um, drones are not allowed, or drones may not be launched or landed in Pacific Grove without a permit. And um, off, also on that permit, it'll say, do not launch or land within like 500 feet of the coastline. So if someone just pulls up, pops out a little drone, up it goes and the birds all start <laughs> screaming, um, that person's probably probably doesn't have a permit. Um, so usually we have, again, in the outreach bin, there's some, um, coastal wildlife disturbance kind of related outreach material. There's a nice little postcard that we made that's specific to Pacific Grove's municipal codes. And one of those is no drones without a permit. So sometimes you can just say, you know, oh, Hey, you know, these birds are clearly reacting to that drone. I bet you're going to get cool pictures, but you're really disturbing this wildlife. This is a national marine sanctuary. We're in a state reserve. You know, there's lots of levels of protection here. And, um, you know, it's it's really important that you bring your drone down. Also, the I always throw in in the end, like, also the cops patrol a lot or the rangers, the park rangers. 
even if that's not true, we, we you say that because you're trying to encourage uh, the behavior, <laughs> the correct yeah. law abiding behavior. Um, but if people are just not wanting to engage or you don't want to engage because none of you are, are, you know, none of you have to feel like you need to go and enforce rules or anything or, or even educate about rules. We're not enforcing. Um, even if you're just not feeling up to it because you just want to talk to people about birds, you can always just call the Pacific Grove um, Police Department non-emergency hotline. And that's on the cards in our bin. Um, you also can call the Caltip hotline. So that's California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it's always good to call at call those guys because they'll have a record and they'll be able to see, oh, we really need to send more of our um, wildlife officers around that Point Pinos area. It's a lot of people there, a lot of tourists, a lot of folks getting down to those tide pools or operating drones, uh, doing illegal stuff. So uh, always good to report those and that information will be in the bin. So yeah, feel free to educate people, but if you don't feel up to it, no pressure to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, Amanda, a yeah. follow-up comment on drones. Yeah. Um, Allison will be taking a drone count this mm -hmm. year for the first time. And um, so don't, don't worry about having to document um, I don't think we're, I don't think we're actually, I think, you know, maybe Baynet folks may want to uh, document your Baynet hours on the Baynet, um, you know, the Baynet documentation, but we don't, we don't have any specific documentation that we need you to do. And Allison is so on top of drones. It's not even funny. <laughs> she dislikes them almost more than we do. So, um, <laughs> she's, She's going to be really, actually, it'll be a separate tally count for her this year. And there are, um, if any of you guys are oyster catcher folks, oyster catcher monitors, you know, there is often drone flights being conducted with permits from NOAA, from the city, um, being conducted for research purposes. And that's really important. And it, they're really working hard to engage with the wildlife monitors, us and the harbor seal folks. Um, to really understand like how to how to operate these things, which are, you know, it's great technology. They can get amazing data and footage of kelp cover, all this important stuff that can in the long term help our wildlife that we love, um, but making sure it's deployed and used in a really, um, you know, least least amount of disturbance. So sometimes those folks will be out. Um, usually we'll probably all be in the loop if it's happening. So uh, most likely if it's one of those little small drones, I mean, they're always it's like little uh, big bee, bee swarms zooming by. Um, those are often just um, recreational drone operators who probably aren't supposed to be flying. Um, just a note, Fred wrote in the chat that there's going to be a sea watching field trip. That's right. Cooper, one of our field trip leaders on November 18th is going to lead a field trip to Point Pinos. So not a lot of trekking around, but teaching about how to ID seabirds um, from land. <laughs> so that's going to be November 18th in the morning. I just posted it on our, our website and maybe on the Facebook page. But yeah, sign up for that if you want to start learning learning how to ID those birds. But by November 18th, lots of you will probably be pros, I bet. Or, or really want to take the field trip. That's right. You should just take, it's just going to be fun. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't think anybody's got like a bet for what like the coolest rare bird is going to be this uh, the sea watch, but I'm like starting to starting to noodle on it. If anybody has any like birds they want to just throw out for like, you know, into the into the universe that we want to see a blue footed booby. I'd like to see one of those fly by. That'd be cool. We'll see. That, that's how about, again, a, how about a pet? How oh, about yeah. a petrol of how about a petrol of any kind? Oh, that would be cool. Those guys are so hard to spot. How about a short tailed albatross? Ooh, that would be the ultimate. Okay. I An think that's adult. Ultimate, but also like could happen. So yeah. not as crazy as some of my ideas. Like no flamingos or something. But um Yeah. That hey, happen. um Amanda, would you talk about um intent uh sea watch birders? Some of, oh, yeah. some of the visitors from out of town who come in for a big flight and kind of what that's like. Yeah, yeah. You made a really good comment on Sunday at our in-person training that, you know, um, some folks travel here. Point Pinos is like, 
um, like the only place on the West Coast to do this kind of bird watching. So we get people from all over the country showing up here. And even some of the locals who are just, they really want to see that they need one species for their life list. The taxonomy changed the other day. And I went down from 429 species or from 430 to 429. So now I'm all like, oh, I got to get that buck up to 430. I got to get, you know, so this bird is like, like me who are like really gunning for that species. Right. So if you go up and you're like, oh, hi, you know, oh, can I, and they're really, mm, mm, they're looking in that scope and they're not, you know, clearly not wanting to engage. Um, don't take it personally. It can be really sometimes intimidating, well, especially when you're starting out. I remember starting out bird watching and you, you're like, all like, yeah, what you guys looking at? And it just might be like birds. And then they look back and you're like, well, I know that, you know, but they're not trying to be <laughs> gruff or anything. They're just, they're trying to get that, see that thing, count those things. Maybe someone told them like, keep your eye on that one. And they're really like, I can't look away. So it's not personal. And a lot of times if you see some, you know, some like happy go lucky family walking up and they're going for that person, because those birders, they look like they know what they're doing. They look really intense. And someone's like, I want to know what he's so intense about. Uh, or she. Uh they want they gravitate maybe to that person. And that's the person who's not gonna want to talk to the public. So, you know, having your vest on, having your pictures ready to go and just like intervene and say, Oh, hi, you know. I'll tell you what these guys are up to because they're clearly really, you know, focused right now. Um, that's a good point, Jan. So thank you for reminding me to tell people that because yes, it's not, don't take it personal. Some people are just, they got to get that thing or they're trying to get a good picture. Everybody's got different things going on. So uh, we can be the ones who are really friendly and approachable and let the serious counters do their serious counting. You can be a serious counter too, if you want. You can always take off your, your cool vest and give people steely looks and say, no, I'm I'm seriously learning today. I'm not just chatting to the public. So you can do either of those things. You're free to do both. Yep. Any other questions? We're at 45 minutes, so I'm pretty early still. Yeah, Albatross is pretty great. What's funny yeah, is the storm petrels, these little tiny guys, yeah, they're really closely related to albatrosses. They're all tube noses. So they have, you can see that little bump on his beak right there. That's where these kind of straw like, um, you know, uh, what would you even call them? Kind of forms on their beak um, are running parallel to the top of their beak and it connects up with their salt gland, which sits in this little kind of groove right above their eye sockets. It helps them to um, get salt out of their, their body, basically, because they're drinking salt water. They're not coming to land to drink fresh water. They're eating salty food. So their blood is like hypersaline. They need to be getting that salt out. And so the salt glands up here and then the duct, not the quack quack duct, but the, you know, tubes come down from there right out of their nostrils. And it just is dripping out a salty, salty snot all day long. So the little tiny storm petrel has that, that uh, anatomy. So does the giant albatross. And our, our MERS, our alcids, they're often low to the water, flapping really hard. You know, they're a diving bird. They dive super deep. So their body's a little heavier. Their body shape requires that they flap hard to stay aloft. Those albatrosses and storm petrels and shear waters, they're the ones who kind of will maybe do a couple flaps, but then it's a lot of soaring. So they're not flapping a lot. They're just, you'll see them riding over the big waves or popping up off the top of the crest of a big wave. And um, yeah, really cool to see. The loons are often flapping kind of hard. They're often really high up on the water or off of the water, uh, loosely aggregated. Surf scoters are pretty dense usually, flapping hard as well, but close together, zooming by. And um, yeah, it's really fun. Often, a lot of these birds are ones that you find dead on the beach. Um, so if you ever walk along the beach and you see some wacky bird, it's like, it's probably one of those op open ocean birds that died out there and now is washed ashore. Sometimes that's like your first introduction to these birds, just because, again, we don't live out on the ocean. We're on land. Most of us, at least. There's got to be some cool sailor sailor folks around who are as familiar with black-footed albatrosses as they are with a dark-eyed junco, but that's not me. All right. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen, I think, and um, see if there's any other questions in the chat. So you watching a field trip. I know, yep. Surf scoter, not scooter. I still don't know what, like, where does that, what's the etymology of the word 
Skoder. I don't know. Only one O in there. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Figure it out someday. Um, but yeah, so thanks everybody so much for wanting to participate, wanting to educate people, wanting to learn and um, and being willing to go out there. It's always kind of, um, you know, it's it's a, it's an effort. You got to drive out to Point Pinos. It might be really cold, um, but it's always fun. You never know what you'll see and and but you'll see something cool, like guaranteed. I think every time I go out, there's something cool that'll happen. So um, any other final questions? I think people are trailing off. Maybe I see a few participants, but. And yeah, starting November 1st, first thing in the morning. So um, feel free to come out just to like see the scene before you sign up for a shift if you want to. Um, I'll try to be out there like most Friday evenings. Other folks are like, you know, I'll always be there Thursday mornings or something. So there should be a lot of familiar faces once you get a week or two into this. And, um, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Super. Amanda, there's a question um, in the chat about oh, vests. Ah, yes, Jacqueline. Hello. She said she's spaced out. Yes, there's some vests in the outreach bins. There's going to be this big bin that Allison will have in her truck that she can bring out every day. And there's going to be some... Uh, a couple different options for vest if you um, don't have one you already wear as part of your like docent uniform or something. Um, there's going to be a high vis orange vest, doesn't have anything on it. There's going to be a Monterey Audubon Society fleece vest with the logo on it. And then there's going to be like a khaki vest that says wildlife monitor and big letters on the back. And I bet that'll attract a lot of attention. So if you wear that one, you'll probably have to answer a lot of questions. But those are the options for you if you want to be really visible and um, get that get that like public uh attention so you can then share the good word you know <laughs> tell them about the birds great thank you very much amanda yeah thanks for joining in tonight cheryl yeah yeah and i'll post this uh recording on our website again if you have if you missed part of it or or you want to tell your friends like you should come out and volunteer it's so fun you can watch this little video get the background and then you show up boom you're learning about birds it'll be great Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Uh -huh. There's like a little bird emoji you, in the chat. I didn't know that existed. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Well, have a good rest of your night. If you're going on to another meeting, good luck. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> yep. Bye, everybody.